Well, let's uh, move on to our teachings. We have been talking about uh, the family of God and the teachings of Paul. Now, let's, let's talk about life in the Son, okay, or life in Jesus. Because we've learned that the moment you get born again, our life is hid in Him. So what does it mean to live in the Son? Now, as Christians, we know that our lives are in Christ. A lot of people say, I surrender my life to Him or I gave my life to Him. Uh, we live for God and we have been uh, bought with a price. So all of that points to belongingness. 1 Corinthians 6.19 Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Now, commonly, we uh, understand body as this one. Of course, it's, it's, it's the initial context. But the Jewish mind thinks differently because they don't have that much separation. They always think in unity. And so when it says your body, coming from a Jew, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's your body, soul, and spirit. Okay? So it's not just the physical body. Whom you have from God and that you are not of your own. You know how, how people, they say, well, this is my life. You know, and this is my body. Well, the Bible says the moment you get born again, you are not of your own. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So the Lord must be exalted in our totality. Not just our spirit, not just our soul, but also in our body. The, uh, the, the, the example that I have seen where in, in the physical body the Lord was glorified was actually the story of Daniel. Remember when uh, King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to feed him, feed him with, their, with their food? It's actually a, a reception of the blessings of the king and an automatic inclusion in the brotherhood of the king, meaning uh, the king has this fellowship wherein he invites all the scholars from all the world, and he will feed them, he provides for them. Uh, one historian says they, they actually have a separate banqueting table just for the scholars that the king had given, had taken from all countries of the world. And from time to time, the king will visit and eat with them, but not, not on a regular basis. So it's a fellowship. But Daniel and his friends decided they won't. They won't eat unclean food. And so... When they look at his body, though, he was more healthy, they were more healthy than the rest of the scholars. In that sense, they glorified God in their body. Now, this life that is committed, that we have committed to God, or a life committed to God, is something that we need, we need to get used living. Because most people, they are Sunday Christians, and a lot of people doesn't know why it is to live for, for God. Even those who have been mature for so many, born again for so many years. It's just a Sunday question. You know, when, when uh, they put on holy clothes, holy faces. In fact, I, I, when, when I was growing up in my religion, there, there's, a, there's kind of like a poker face. You know, can hardly break a smile. That's, that's the look of holiness. But that's so in the scriptures. You will find the Lord rejoicing. The Bible says when the apostles reported that, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And the Bible says, and Jesus rejoiced in the spirit. The literal rendering there is, and, and Jesus is spun around. You know how the Jewish dance, they normally dance in circle. So it's not just that he is spinning around, he rejoiced and begin to, to uh, lock elbow with his disciples. And uh, you should see it's a very common Jewish dance. They, they lock elbows and they begin to, uh, kind of like the Irish, you know. They, they, they have that dance, but uh, not like the Jews, of course. The Jews circle around. I don't know what the Irish do. But uh, I know they, what do they do? They do lateral moves? In a line, okay. Whatever, okay, I don't dance. So. Now, <clears throat> We already learned in the past also that we are a part of the household of faith. Now, all of this points to we belong to Him. 
the moment you are part of a house, I think one of the uh, hindrances that we have is whenever we think of a house of a family, we're thinking of a Western house, a Western family. The Bible is an Eastern concept, okay? And in the East, even today, when you say family, that's different. It's blood thicker than, blood is th- thicker than water is more true in the East than in the West. <laughs> you, you see this, uh, this uh, uh, 30-year-old man that, that refused to leave the house of his parents. The parents sued him. That's not Asian. <laughs> Uh, in, in, in Asia, our children live with us, our grandparents live with us, our aunt, uncle, and whoever wishes to come, they, they, they drop in. So the, you can see that there's, a, there's an Eastern concept, Eastern culture that is more adaptable in, in, the, in the Scripture. So when, when you say member of a house, that, that doesn't get erased, you see. And you cannot turn, turn your back, and you don't, you don't sue your, your uh, member of the family, you know. Uh, but of course, the Western influence got into the church. That's why when Paul was talking about judgment, he said, don't you have anybody among you who can judge this, these conflicts? Why? Because in the Jewish community, they have somebody who can judge the, conf- the conflict, but not in the, in the Western community, okay? So... All of these and other points to the truth that we belong to Him. If we belong to Him, then our lives now is to, supposed to be lived in the Son. Okay? We are supposed to nurture our lives in Jesus Christ. He is the center. Some of you are familiar with four spiritual laws of uh, the Campus Crusades for Christ. They, they truly emphasize that you know, there's a chair and, and Jesus is in the center. There's heart. Jesus is in the center. We are beginning to lose that a lot because of liberalism and progressivism. They are now beginning to say religion is private. Do it in your own privacy. Don't bring it to public. But that is not Bible because Bible is Jesus is at the very center of our lives. So let's, let's uh, introduce this topic and uh, look, look first at the scriptures uh, on life in the sun, Romans 5.17. Romans 5.17. For if by the transgression of the one, that is Adam, death reigned <clears throat> through the one. I want, I want you to, uh, to uh, see this. The uh, preposition through, it's a uh, preposition of agency, okay? If you say, if you say, the water is flowing through this faucet, that means the faucet becomes the channel, becomes the agency. Don't, don't take it out of your mind because... Of the, of the individual application that we can do in, in this one. For if, by, for if by the transgression of one, death reigned to the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one. Now look at this. For if by the transgression of the one, singular, okay? Now, when Adam sinned, Adam himself became the conduit of death. Okay? Because of through. Before life was flowing through him. The moment he rebelled against God, death was introduced. And wherever Adam was, death is. Because, because here, death reigned through the one. But then, on the second part of the sentence, much more those who receive, much more. And then, and then the pronoun, those. Much, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one. So now, through Adam, death flowed. Through Christ, we became the channels of life. 
Okay? We as the temple of the Holy Spirit became the channels of life. Now, now listen, listen, listen to this. Most, most uh, well, if, if you are living in an individualistic society, you don't concern yourself to the effects of your own actions and decisions on others. You just simply say, well, it's my decision. If they want to follow, it's up to them. But that is not Bible thinking. Bible thinking is what you do affects others. What Adam did affected all of creation. I mean, all of creation. This, this is the, that what we're going to read later is very offensive uh, to President Duterte. He could not imagine that through the sin of one man, death will flow on the whole human race. But that is the case. But then, look at this. That's through one man. And from one man, death flow. But the moment you get born again and we become Christians, we become the vessels, the channels of life. Now, of course, it started in Jesus, that we become the channels of life. That wherever we go, life should, should flow. Wherever the influence of Adam is, death flows. That's why it's called rivers of living water that, that flows in us. What we have is the water of life. And so wherever we are, we become vessels of life and we become uh, channels of life. Jesus Christ. So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. The law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now going back to what I said, uh, because this passage is part of a larger section that started in verse 12. Starting in verse 12, Paul presented the superiority of the gospel over every teaching. And it has become a source of controversy because in, in verse 12 it says, therefore just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and so death is spread to all men because all sin. I mean, President Duterte said, he used profanities, he said, he said, it's a stupid religion. And he said, what kind of God is that who will allow through one man for, uh, for death to reign? Well, because he doesn't understand this concept. Now listen to me. Our lives are interconnected. Whatever decisions we make affects others. You have heard this teaching that the moment you're part of the covenant, Jesus said himself, if you give a prophet a glass of water, you will, you will receive the prophet's reward. Because of this thinking. It is not a thinking, oh, I want to have reward. Let me look for prophets and give them water. That's, that's not what it means. The reason why you give the prophet water is because you are part of the covenant. And so because you are part of the covenant, you are blessing this prophet. Okay? And because you are part of the covenant, when you bless the prophet, God, will, God is blessing the prophet. The blessings flows in you. The prophet becomes the channel of blessing. You see that through. That we were he becomes the channel of blessing. Now the moment you oppose him, you block life. You know? And what you have is, is, is death. And this is, this is an oriental concept that has been lost in the West. We think that this is my action, this is my decision, but that is not so, you know. I told you the story of this uh, Filipino uh, male work in Hong Kong. We met, we met, uh, we met them, in, in fact, my wife and uh, uh, Sister Cherry, spend more time with her, with them. Because, you know, difficulty of income in the Philippines, she, she talked with uh, her husband. Her husband can't make it to Hong Kong, so they decided, 
we're gonna explore, okay, you go to Hong Kong. So the, I'm sorry, my, my, my mistake. The husband went to Hong Kong. So he worked there, worked his tail, tails off, and started saving money, sending them to the Philippines. And they tell the story that uh, this guy was going home because the wife is with another man. And the man who was working in Hong Kong, whenever he sends money, that money is not being spent in his, spent in his family. It's being spent to the wife and to the other man. And so he said, I'm going to go home. So they tell the story that upon going home, you know, as the airplane begins to inch closer and closer to the Philippines, he went to the bathroom and did not go out. He attempted to kill himself. He said, I do not know what I'm going to do. Now, the woman sinned. But look, the man and the woman talked. They said, for, for better livelihood, you go to Hong Kong and, uh, so that our family will be supported. That decision affected the whole family. Yeah. The wife has sexual needs which should be met with him. But because of that decision and the weakness of the flesh, it ruined the family. So when people say, well, this is my decision, that's a very selfish statement. Because our lives are interconnected, whether you like it or not. You know, you offend Sister Nikki, you offend her uh, children, her children have friends, you offend their children's friends. Their friends have families. Of course, it will be, it will be watered down in, as, as it goes through the process of exchanging information, but it's the whole effect. You see? So nobody makes a decision that only affects himself. There are always uh, effects effects on others, you know. When, when, uh, and when I and I decided we we're going to get married here, it affected our children. They were not born in the Philippines, you know. When we decided to, uh, to move to uh, Edgebrook against uh, Lowell, it, that was a, an up and down thing because, because the school system here is number one before, and so no way that our kids, so we went there. The moment we moved, we were very disappointed because we should have stayed in that region. You know why? Because the CPS keeps tweaking the qualifications. And so they made it difficult for, for uh, Tier 1 to make into the selective enrollment program. You know, when they, I, I said, why in the world did we move Dur during that time? During the time, we have two houses because we have not sold the house yet. We tried to use the old house address, but too late because we are already registered on the new address. So that decision affected everything, and, and, and whatever decision you make affects others. When children make decisions, it affects the parents. When parents make decisions, it affects the children. And it is a selfish person who said, it's my life, it's my body, it's my decision. You are selfish. Because whether you like it or not, your decisions affects others, especially the closest people in your life. And so, this concept of being a channel of life or death, okay, your influence within your circle is either construction or destruction. It's either life or death. That's your, that's your influence. Now, if your life is lived in Jesus, we reign in life. That means our influence is life. Okay? If, if my kids uh, said that, oh, we're, we're going to do whatever we want, well, my influence changes that. You know. Uh, at one time, uh, I think it was my second son who, who said, well, you know, we're 18 years old, so we're going to do what, what we want. I said, Really? So you're ready to leave the house? And they were surprised. Well, if you don't want my influence anymore and my leadership, you leave the house. They backed down. 
that decision influenced them. Now, my kids saw that. It, it, the most disciplined child that I have is Joseph. Yeah. He was the guinea pig. I mean, that boy, you know, look at him. He lost weight because of discipline, yeah. Lost 180 pounds. Huh? I mean, too much beating, you know, in jogging. <laughs> but, but John will saw him, and DJ will saw him, and the kids will saw my, my discipline. And it affected them. I don't have to apply much discipline to my younger, younger kids. You see? Now, because Joseph decided that he will submit. Do you know that his siblings right now listen to him? Yeah. They, they listen to him now. Because they saw, ah, oh, the facts. You allow one child in your house to be rebellious, it affects others. You see? So, how are you going to reign? If your life is in Jesus, how are you going to reign? Are you going to reign in death or in life? I always tell parents, <laughs> you allow your first child or somebody else to do whatever they want. Well, tough. Because you will lose the right for the next one. Well, you allowed my kuya or my other to do whatever they want. What about me? You lose your argument. There goes the channeling of Life or death. Okay? Now, you have to work on it by faith. Otherwise, if you are not careful, the influence that you wield on others may be negative instead of positive. The influence of Adam, of course, was, 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 not, was not good. And uh, when Paul was writing this, certainly he was thinking about the first Adam, and then, of course, he said, Jesus, the second Adam. Adam disobeyed as the first one. This began a process in conflict with the original creation. By the way, we, we see this. We say, for example, this is a company, and we say, this is the company policy, okay? Uh, well, let's, let's uh, apply it more in, in public realm. NFL. The policy of the NFL is this. When the, when the, when the national anthem is being played, you stand up and put your hand on, 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 on your chest. You know? That's their policy. Well, somebody decided he will violate that. The name, and, and he's a Christian. Now, now I heard that he, he got converted into, into Islam, you know. He's a Christian. He's the favorite NFL player of my brother-in-law. Always, always bragging about him. Now he doesn't mention his name, you know. Uh, so Colin Kaepernick, Kaepernick decided, well, I'm, go I'm going to sit down or kneel and, and just violate this policy. The decision of one man affected the whole league. It affected the income. It affected the viewership. Now, in, now they are in chaos because of one man. He became a channel of disrespect. You see this? He's a Christian, or he was a Christian. Channel. And then, look, look, look at what happened. One team won championship in the NFL, and, and the star player decided, I'm not going to go to the White House. The other players decided, and now it's in the high school. Do you know that, uh, that, that sitting down, kneeling, is in the high school level now? By one man. The question is, what kind of influence are you wielding on others? Now, if you are living your life in the sun, it's got to be life. It's got to be life. Because if it's not life, then it's not, it's not the sun. So, because of Adam, even the whole plant and animal creation was affected. We touched that before when we were looking at Romans chapter 8. Walang... I mean, the, the animals are doing nothing. They were not even eating each other in those days, you know. The animals were, were herbivorous. And because of uh, what, what, Adam, what Adam did, even the animal creation is longing for the revelation of the sons of God. You see, one man's decision. Jesus obeyed and began the process of harmony 
with creation and with God. His obedience, through His obedience, the reign of life began. That's why He came preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. You see, the reign, reign of life. The reign of heaven kingdom is the reign of God. The rule of God is here. Now, of course, it has to spread the, by, the, by the way that the sin of Adam is spread. Adam's action resulted in death. Oh, the actions of Jesus resulted in the gift of God's grace. You know, there, there is a... Oh, I forgot that song. They were raising, raising money for Africa, something like that. Michael Jackson came up with a song. Yeah, we are the world. There's, uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, that's good. Because I forgot what I was going to talk about, you know. So in verse 15, a gift of grace flowed to the same people who were affected by what Adam did to humanity. The same. So the world was poisoned. Jesus began to remove the poison. But it is through the obedience, key word there, through the obedience of one man. Now look at that. Through the disobedience of one man. And then through the obedience of one man. Those are key. You want to to wield death, be disobedient. You want to wield life or influence life, be obedient. You see? Uh, people think life in the sun is, oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Oh, it's a lot more than that. It's a, it's a relationship with God, covenant with Him. It's living, living your life for Jesus. And, and verse, verse 17 from what we read gives us this very clear contrast uh, of the resulting of the res- of the of the of the resulting actions, one Adam and one Jesus. So as a as a quick application of this, we should never undermine the decision of one person. You know, we should never undermine the decision of one person. It can change. By the way, we saw it. Remember when when Obama became president. He said, I will fundamentally change America. He did. I mean, he did. Remember when, when uh, Alexandria Cortez in New York won the nomination? It is now changing the Democratic Party. That's, that's the effect, just one. When Bernie Sanders won, it changed the Democratic Party. It put it into chaos. Because suddenly they begin to realize that there is a wing in the Democratic Party that is progressive. When the Tea Party, remember how, how the conservatives were being to lose ground? The Tea Party was, was born. It changed the Republican movement. So right now, both parties are in chaos. The Republicans are being pulled by the right-wing uh, Tea Partiers, and uh, the Democrats are being pulled by the progressive left. By the, by the result of one person, just, just one person. I remember when, when, during the 2016 presidential nomination, I mean, Hillary is going to win. There was no Republican candidate that can withstand her. Well, Trump decided to run. It changed the whole thing. And then one news, I forgot what news was that, they decided to make a joke out of it. You know, when when I was making these readings, uh, one of the things that really pushed him to run some people will call it pride. Remember when in that, uh, in that uh, gathering, one person made a joke to him, and humiliated him. He said, well, I heard that Trump is running. Please, by all means, run, and I will write the first check. And he was laughing. And Trump was somber face and just very upset. That triggered him. One man made a joke of him in public. They should have left him alone. But one man, yeah. Now, I'm showing you this because your decisions are critical, you know. No matter how insignificant you may think you are, yeah. Okay, you, you, you take a child. Maybe he's not the brightest in the family, okay? You have 10 children. This child is not the brightest. He's always being nursed and 
and uh, like, like uh, the favorite sick person in the family. But everybody loved him. Well, he decided one of his, one of his, his, his dad is a businessman, his, his mom is a career woman, you know, his two siblings are professionals, but they are very neat together. Well, he decided, well, I'm the least in the family, I'm going to kill myself, I'm going to commit suicide. So she, he, he or she took an overdose of medicine, and suddenly he's gasping for life. They called 911, rushed to the emergency. Guess what happened? The dad took off from work, the mom took off from work, the siblings took off from work, and they decided to watch him 24-7. It changed the whole life. That's how, so don't, don't say that that person is insignificant. No, the decision of one person always affects a lot more than you think. Are you listening? And so value the decisions that you're making in your life. Value it. Because you do not know what effect it has on other people's lives. Verses 18 21 from what we read tells us uh, what the life on, on the sun actually is. Well, in, in, in verse, uh, verse 18, let me, let me read it to you again, okay? I lost it here. So then, as through one's, one transgressions, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. Now, I want to I clarify something here. That verse does not mean that all will be saved or what we call as universalism. Okay? Not all will be saved. Because on the other hand, not all will go to hell. I, I don't know why in the sin of Adam, we have no problem saying, well, not everybody will go to hell. Well, on the opposite side, not everybody also will go to heaven. It's not universalism. Why is it not universalism? Because you cannot ignore the whole, the whole uh, Bible, the, new, the whole New Testament, or the whole Book of Romans in, the, in its context. This is referring to potential salvation. Every person who is born can potentially go to heaven or hell. You know why adultery, of all the sins in the scriptures, and even today, it seems like all sins can easily be forgiven, but not adultery. Okay. You know why is it like that? Why? Because only a man and a woman has the ability to reproduce another human being with an eternal soul that can potentially go to either heaven or hell. Yeah. I mean, when an elephant dies, it's dead. You know, that's it. Does it go to heaven? There is no dog heaven, you know. Uh, I mean, there's none. You, you will not find it in the scriptures. The animals belong here on earth. There will be plenty of animals here. That's what the Bible says. They will be at peace with humanity when Jesus returns. But only... Two human beings can reproduce another human being with an eternal soul that can potentially go to heaven or hell. So you are a Christian. You commit adultery with an unbeliever, so you raise, uh, you raise the kid. So the other partner says, well, they're not going to go to church. And the other one says, oh, he's going to go to church, or she's going to go to church. So they fought. Then one day, this, this boy or girl grew up, and you are a Christian, so you begin to teach the child. Child, serve God, obey Him, read the Bible. And so he began to read, and it says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And he looked or she looked at you and said, Mom, Dad, what does it mean? Well, well, you know, it means like this. And he looked at you and said, But you committed adultery. Wow. You, you, you deplate right away. Now, of course, there's a solution to that. You have to humble yourself. And you begin to say, well, son or daughter, I, I, I sinned against God and I, I already asked for forgiveness and God forgave me. But I'm telling you, in, in the mind of that little child, very difficult to handle. You, you remember that illustration? This boy was, a preacher was, uh, uh, well, Tony, uh, Mike, Michael Evans, the, the, the Jewish, the Jewish uh, 
Evangelist Villa Center in Jerusalem. Uh, he, his mom is Jewish, married to a supposedly Christian who beats up on his mom all the time. He hated Christianity because this Christian is beating up on my mom. You know, and the only reason why he got saved is because Jesus appeared to him. Yeah, but some th- this boy was was listening to this preacher saying, "God is your father." Give your life to him. And he said, no. And said, if God is father like my father, I don't want God. My dad beats up on me. My dad abuses me. You see, the effect, the effect of, of the family, the effect of the significant uh, close relationships, this effect. Oh, but, but we are not staying it in here and in here. This is my decision. It's my own decision. Who cares? Well, you've got to care because your life significantly affects others. We have to be wise in our decision-making process. Now, what is being referred to, as I said, is potential salvation because everyone has to respond in faith and repentance. God always takes the initiative, though. Look at this. John 6, 44. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last days. You see the, the initiative of God there? He draws people to Christ. You know. uh, he, Jesus claims that he said, oh, the Father draws people. Th- that means... Um, Whoever and however many people are drawn close to you, it's the Father drawing them. He says, look, look at this. I, I, was, I was talking last week to, to somebody, and he, he got hired in a new job. And he was a Christian for a long time, but he, he backslid. You know. Just started coming to a church in the suburbs. And from time to time, he, he contacts with me. And he said, Brother Jose, I, I, I got hired in a new job. In fact, two jobs are, are trying to hire him right now. He got hired and then another, another company wants to hire him. He said, I, I got hired. And he said, it's, it's a good thing. I said, what, what's good? He said, I can restart all over again. My schedule is good. I can go to church. Uh, I can restart all over again. I don't have to to really share, he said, these people doesn't know me, so I can just restart. I said, excuse me, what are you doing in that company? And he said, well, I'm working there. He's in the uh, uh, factory. Uh, how do you call that? When you assemble something, put together something. And uh, he said, so nobody will have to know me. I said, I said, you are there in your mind just as an assembly person. But I said, God still sent you there as a missionary. I said, whether you just are coming back from, from hiatus or hibernation, you never stop being a witness. You're still a witness. Whether you, good, you give good witness or bad witness, you're a witness. I said, you're a missionary in that place. And he looked, he kept quiet for a while. He says, what do you mean? I said, you are a missionary there. You're still a witness. Your life affects others. Now listen some, some people brag, I have tons of friends. Yeah, what are you doing to those people? Yeah. Why are they being drawn to you? They are being drawn to you because God wants you to share him to them. Now, Jesus had these tons of people being drawn to him. He never used it for politics, never used it for business. But every people that was drawn to him, he preached the gospel to them. Now, not, not everybody except at one point, everybody left except the apostles. But he kept preaching because they were drawn. They were given a chance. Every person that comes in contact with you after they're born again, God is giving them a chance to know Jesus. The question is this. Is that in our hearts? Huh? Those of you who are working for companies, you are a missionary there. Those of you who work in schools, you are a missionary there. Every person that God draws to you, he says, the Father is the one who draws because Jesus is in you. So they draw them to you, 
and you are supposed to share the gospel to them. But each individual must respond personally. Okay? Mark 11, and oh, I'm sorry, Mark 1, 15. And saying, the time is fulfilled. Kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Again, the potential. It's like an advertisement. You know, when, when, uh, when Seafood City was about to open. Do you guys remember that? A lot of you, I think, got coupons. There, are, there is a trial. Some, some Jollibee people even came here. There was a, from California, there was a trial meal. Uh, any of you went there? I think, I think some of my family members went there. It's a trial meal. It's, a, it's an advertisement. Why? Because they want to draw the Filipinos, majority, to Seafood City. It's, it's, it's a come on. So, Seafood City is there. But are all Filipinos going there? The answer is no. Yeah. Some Filipinos went there and then they realized it's expensive. So, some are nostalgic. So, they keep going back. You know? Uh, I keep going back there. Yeah. Especially for their pandesal. You know, it's... It is so good. Yeah. But, but there, is, there, there is this sense that the door is open. Are you going to come in? Everybody has to, each of us, our parents cannot make a decision for us. We have to make our own decision. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So, the moment you get born again, the moment you come to him, so, so Jesus, the Father is drawing you to him, the moment you respond to that, you are blessed to being a child of God. But you have to respond. You know, I, I cannot, uh, my first kids, the youngest age, I led them to the Lord. The younger ones, my wife led them to the Lord. You know. The most inquisitive of them all pertaining to the faith is Joel. Now, the reason why he is inquisitive, all of them are inquisitive, but the reason they're inquisitive because, because Jesus is part of our table conversation. Yeah. Papa, why, why, why are you going to the Philippines when they were younger? Why are you going to the Philippines? I never told them because the church is sending me. I tell them, well, because Jesus is sending me there. What? Yeah, does Jesus talk to you? I said, yeah. And then one day, Joel just came to me and said, Papa, God is angry with me. I said, why? He doesn't talk to me. I said, well, well, you, ha- you have to, to really listen to his voice. Said, he said, he'll talk to you. He doesn't, he doesn't necessarily thunder. And you begin to explain in a, in a child's game. I said, you, you have to pay attention. And when I was saying that, Joseph just, uh, Joel just kept quiet like this. <laughs> and then opened his eyes and says, he's really angry. <laughs> he's still not talking. I said, because Jesus is part of our conversation. Yeah. Part of our conversation. We have relatives in Chicago that are connected with people that uh, have abominable lives, that God's is abomination. I would never let my kids attend parties with them. Yeah. Now they make their own decision, and they ask why. I said, because Jesus doesn't like that. Yeah. This is what the Bible, Jesus doesn't like that. I made Jesus, I and I made Jesus part of our conversation. Why? Because he reigns in us. I mean, Anne takes care of all people, help neighbors. You cannot receive Anne's help without hearing about Jesus. First thing she did when she, was, she started taking care of our neighbor, old lady, is begin to introduce her to Jesus. And so one day she said, okay, I'm going to receive Jesus. So they prayed, right? And Anne is... Makulet, you know? 
So she kept telling him, telling her, you need to receive Jesus. And she said, Anna, I already received him. How many times do I have to receive him? You know? Because that's, that's Anne. She, will, she, will, she, will, she brings Jesus with her. You have to make her part, you, you have to make Jesus part of our conversation. Romans 10, starting on verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bounding in riches. For all who call on him, who, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, when it says whoever will call on him, it doesn't mean, hi! You know? To call on him is to believe on him. Because call on the Lord and he may be found. That's, that's the uh, second part of the verse. When you say you, f- you found the Lord, you found the answer. Well, actually, it's, it's a subjective statement. Actually, the Lord found you. You were lost sheep. And, and you respond to it. You, know, you respond to it. Whether you will receive help or not. This is the way it is. You, you look at war-torn uh, places, and everybody is shooting you know, soldiers. And so when you're about to rescue people, you have to tell, we're, we're friends, you know. Sometimes if an American, we're Americans, they, they, they'll say that. Because who knows who you are? They can change uniforms, and you hold guns, you can shoot me also. So they have to placate them and say, hey, listen, we're, we're, we're here for you. We, we, we love you, and we want to we wanna rescue you. But they have to respond. Because if they don't respond, they will be, they will be uh, lost. Remember that uh, fire in Denver? The government posted an announcement, police leave the place, and they never did. I think one person died because they, they refused. Oh, we're far from the fire. I mean, these this, this wildfires can, can really grow in no time. Well, one person died. And the government was being blamed, and they said, well, we sent all the alarms, we, we told everybody, and nobody listened. These people did not listen. They thought they're not subject to this. Well, there's been a lot of fires before, it's not going to affect. Well, it affected them this time. Affected them this time. You know. And so we, we, we have to respond. And whoever believes will not be disappointed. People say, well, Christianity is very disappointing. Well, I don't know what kind of Christianity you got yourself into. But the Christianity that is in the Bible is not disappointing. It gives life. It gives provisions. I mean, it operates in love and faith and hope. How can it be disappointing? Obama's uh, campaign slogan is uh, hope, right? Uh, Hope. Hope and change. I mean, it's, it gravitates people. Hope and change. You see? And, and, uh, and the, you will not be disappointed. That's what uh, God says. And, and Jesus is saying, well, I'll give you life. You're, you're dead and you're on your way to hell. I'll give you life. And the Bible says, you will not be disappointed. I say, well, how come some people are disappointed? Well, I don't know how you're following Jesus. Of course, there are difficulties. There are trials from time to time. But we are not living on trials 24-7. There are moments of, of joy. By the way, joy is not removed because we are going through sufferings or, or trials. Joy is what gives us strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's what uh, Nehemiah said. Remember the, the people of Israel were being discouraged? Because there was very little progress and they were working hard and the enemies are surrounding them. And Nehemiah said, well... Let's do this. Let's throw in a party. Those of you who have not, others with, with something, share with them. So everybody ate and rejoiced. But Nehemiah did not 
sometimes say, well, the only solution is really you eat well and, and to be good with you. But they begin to be happy. Eating food, right? And sharing and fellowshipping. But Nehemiah really qualified what's happening by saying, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now listen, God brought about joy using food as instrument. You see that? Yes, as, uh, you look at the scriptures on how, on, on, on how uh, God distributes peace. This, look, you're in, you're, you are uh, in turmoil inside, right? Man, the enemies are coming. Can you imagine if you're in a war-torn district? The enemy is coming, and you're a Christian. The soldiers came in. UN Peace Military Corps came in. You begin to have peace. So actually, when God sends joy and peace, there are instruments. Now, supernaturally, God can superimpose joy and peace in your life. But most of the time, the peace, joy, comes when God uses agents. You, you, are, you are in care. I lost my job, you know. How am I going to pay the bills? Well, you're using it and praying, oh, God, give me, give me victory over this one. And you're wondering, man, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got two months savings. If I don't get me a job in two months, I will be depleted. How am I going to pay the bills? You know, and you're praying, oh, God, help me. And your friend calls, hey, I heard you have no job. You know, our company just opens a position. Would you be willing to, to, uh, to apply? The pay is commensurate with what you're doing before. In fact, our benefits are more. The more he talks, what happened? That, that uh, chaos inside, it began to dissipate. Now, I am now going back to what I said. Death came through one man, life through one man. Whoever gave the call became the channel through which peace came. That's the way, can, can you imagine if uh, you are that channel? Oh, I, I'm, I'm very proud of this church. Remember the testimony that we had on uh, Pastor Judy Nguera? I'm telling you, that guy is bragging about you all the time. He cannot afford the medicine. We supply him with medicine every three months. The last supply of medicine we gave him was worth $500. Where in the world is he going to get the money? His church is in the slums. You know, this church is, uh, I think it's smaller than this. You know, and it's, it's crumb. And I went there, I want to buy them an air condition. There is one air condition. And uh, I, I told Brother Willie, they need another air conditioning. And Brother Willie told me, they don't need air conditioning, they need a bigger place. You know? And, and I, I told you this testimony, the, the doctor came. And, and he, he, is in, he, he lost his sight. He could no longer walk. And the doctor said so many, uh, so many problems physically. So he gathered his family. And I love the story. Gathered the family. And the children, some of them are disobedient. The children said, Dad, you've been serving God. What is this? And he said, children, let's praise God for this. I said, what? He said, look, I have had, I, it, it, it turned out I have had this sickness for a long time. He said, can you imagine if I found out about this sickness a few years ago? Then I have to decide, am I going to send you to college or am I going to buy medicine? That's a channel of life right there. The guy is dying and you're talking like that. And the children says, what, what, what do you mean that? I said, look, thank God I got the news that I'm dying, that you are done in school because all of them are being hired and have, are working. One is going to be a police officer. And uh, thank God I got the news because then I don't have to make a choice whether I will send you to college or I will... I will leave. And he said, children, you know my decision. I'd rather die but, and send you to college. But then you will be warned and you will tell me, take the medicine, you will not go to college. He said, thank God. And they were shocked. 
And so he was ready to die. He lost sight. He could no longer travel. He traveled, so he could no longer travel. I was even upset because I was calling him. He was not answering. It turned out he cannot see the, the screen on the phone. His wife has to pick up the phone and, and slide whatever needs to be, is, you know, and answer. He, he cannot answer. No. Well, well, I heard about it, but I really heard about it. You know, but I really get upset. You know, but it really is. Go to the doctor and all that. Well, the reason why he cannot go to the doctor that much is because of money. Well, one, you know what happened? God used him. One of our brothers, his name is Edgar. I know if, if some of you remember Edgar, he used to work with us in Baguio City. And uh, he decided, he, he dragged this guy from his house and said, bring her a doctor. That's channel of life. Now, can you imagine that? Drag him, put him in his car, we'll go. And he did not only bring him to the doctor. He bring him to the best doctor that he knows. And so, diagnosis was given. Another person says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy the first set of medicines and bought all, all the medicines and there's a little bit of improvement. But then he cannot sustain. He lost the sight again. That's when I heard about it. I said, well, Lion's Heart is going to take care of the medicine. Yeah. So now he's up and going. He's traveling around again. I told him not to, but he's traveling around again. I became, you guys became channel of life. Now this, this remember I told you for the first time, uh, in Lion's Heart history, for the first time. We have a church who are doing first consultation in Cagayan de Oro. And they said, we are going to pay for all the food for three days. Never happened that first time we were going there. You know, the pastor of the church is one of the pastors of Pastor Juni Guerra. Now they're becoming channels of life to others. A true partner in the Lord. This is it, one man's decision affects others. You see? And do you guys know that when we became a church, we will be used by the Lord to become channels of blessings? We suspended. I, I don't even know why we suspended the medical mission. Maybe. Maybe we are not just paying attention to it. But when we became a church, can you imagine, do we really know that uh, we're going to be able to do all of this? But that decision made members of Lion's Heart channels of blessings to uh, some people. Just, just right decision. And so, although this is universal, the application is personal. But the offer is always universal. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions, thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. Well, one, one translation reads, intercessions for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all goodness and dignity that is good and acceptable in the sight of God who desires all men to be saved to come in knowledge of him. Now, let, let me take the first part and I guess I'll end there. That intercession be made for all men. That context in, in, uh, in that passage in, in Timothy and in Romans is referring to oh, government, Nero, Roman Empire, tyrants. First of all, intercession. What is intercession? Let's, let's munch on that a little bit, okay? <laughs> What is intercession? What? It's standing between the God. Yeah? A lot of people think intercession is, I'll pray for you. That's not intercession. Intercession is when you stand in the God. The other term for that is mediator. Okay? So these two are fighting, you know, because she's sleeping and she's awake. So, so they are fighting, right? And, and they are really ready to kill each other. Somebody needs to intercede. What is intercession? If I intercede, I stand in between. Now, this is intercession. Intercession, I said, why are you 
fighting with Genesis. And she said, well, because you know, Genesis eats the best donuts and she's not sharing. <laughs> yeah. So what, what, what do you want? Well, if Genesis will share a little bit of her donuts, I will be happy. Why are you angry with DJ? Well, DJ eats the best hot dogs. Yeah. Uh, two of the most fattening foods in America, you know. <laughs> DJ eats the best. So what do, what do you want? Well, if DJ will share from time to time some hot dogs, I'll be happy. So I, I come to her and I says, DJ is willing to share some hot dogs. Hey, Genesis is willing to share some donuts. Is there anything else so that you will be at peace? I don't like not just donuts, but fresh donuts. I don't want the leftover donuts. Okay? I want when she bought it from the store, I want the first piece to be mine. So I want, that's what she wants. Okay, for the sake of peace. And then, yeah, I want my hot dog with Coke. You know? So I went to her and says, that's what intercession is. You know why Jesus is the mediator between God and man? Because God and man were at hostility. And so Jesus looked at the Father and said, what do you want? And the Father says, somebody, they had, they had to pay for their sin. That's what they said. They have to pay for their sin. And I have been sending prophets and they're not listening. They have to pay for their sin. They have to repent and pay for their sin. Because the uh, divine justice was upset. It has to be satisfied. And uh, Jesus went to earth and basically said, well, man, God says, you have to pay for your sin. And man says, we tried everything. We tried sacrifices, we tried good works, we tried good characters. It's not working. We always fail. So what do you suggest? Well, I think we really need help on this part. And so God said, Jesus went to the Father and says, well, they're doing their best. They establish religions. They have good works. It's not working. And the Father says, but that's what I want. And Jesus made a suggestion and said, what if I die for them? Are you willing to do that? Now that I'm your son, are you willing to give me? That's intercession. That's why you can, you know when people tell you, I'm interceding for you, and they criticize you, they're liars. They cannot possibly, you cannot be a gossip and be an intercessor, period. Because an intercessor, an intercessor listens to both sides and make them come together. Yeah. No gossip is an intercessor. You cannot be a gossip and be an intercessor. Because you cannot bring two parties at peace when you're bad-mouthing each other. What you are doing is taking the concepts from each party. It's like reconciliation. That's why we have been given the mystery of reconciliation. You know? So now we, we become like that. Because it's, an, it's a universal potential. It's a universal appeal. We have to come to the knowledge of Jesus. He's the mediator. And we now we become the mouthpiece. And have you noticed people object to us? Like Duterte's objection should be answered. What kind of God is that? Well, that is an unbeliever. That is his objection. What kind of God is this that because of the sin of one man, well, somebody has got to answer him. Somebody who will not criticize him. Somebody who will not put him down. But come to him and answer him and say, well, Rodrigo Duterte. You know. And you, you begin to find illustrations. Remember that uh, book written by Dan Richardson? Peace Child. It's a true story. They made it into a movie. Dan Richardson was uh, sent as a missionary to this African tribe. And I think he's been working there for a couple of years and nobody is going, getting saved. Just nobody's getting saved. And so he made a movie out of it. And uh, he was praying to God, oh Lord, give me wisdom. Nobody's getting saved. Well, one day there was a war. He was ministering on two tribes. One day there was a war that took place between these two tribes. 
and both of them like him. So they, they begin to talk through him, and he began to talk, and say, hey, come on, let's have peace. And both of them finally gave the solution and says, there is a solution that we have done before. We have not done in ages. What is the solution, uh, Don Richards and I? Well, there's got to be a peace child. What's a peace child? Well, we will choose a child from them and from us, and we will make our treaty of peace using those children that for as long as the, those children are alive, peace stays. And the light bulb, ding! He said, it's the same thing. With God. I don't want to preach it. Yeah. There is hostility between God and man and for, for that peace to be, uh, to be entered into, God sent a peace child. And for as long as that child is alive, peace will stand. And then he began to share that, you know, Jesus died, but he lives again, and he will never die again. That's why peace will stand. That's how they get saved. Yeah. Now, now this is the amazing thing. And this is where being a minister or being a missionary came into play. So they get saved, right? But he's got to teach them communion. Yeah, he's got to teach them communion. Problem is, those tribes, they have a communion doctrine. What is the communion doctrine? It's similar to the drunkards in the Philippines. You use one cup. Now, these are primitive people, so they put on one, and everybody drinks from the same cup. Now, you cannot say it's not hygienic. Well, tough. You just have to drink it. But because he's the mediator, he cannot say, I will not drink. He will be the reason why they will fight again. You see? Now, that, that, is, that is now what intercession is. That is a, and when Paul said, because the appeal for everybody to be saved is universal, you have to mediate. Yeah. Now, some people intercede wrongly. Okay, you, you want to be an idolater? You can keep three idols, it's okay. No, that's wrong, because that's not what God wants. You've got to give to men what God wants. Well, it's, it's, okay. it's okay to commit adultery. Well, God is, no, 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 no deal. No deal. Just no deal. There are certain things that God will say, no deal. Now you have to find ways for both parties to accept. That's intercession. And that's why the Bible says that blessed are the peacemakers. You see? Those peace, peacemakers, they are the intercessors. Because, look, the appeal is universal. Now, we, I don't know that much about business, but, but have you noticed the, uh, the way Trump wants to forge? Now, I know my Bible is not going to happen uh, on a lasting solution, but have you noticed the one thing that Trump always tells Putin, Kim Jong-un, it will be good for your country. You will enter into prosperity. What is he doing? He is interceding. He's saying, let's talk. It'll be good for you. And then he said, well, if you fight us, it will be bad for you. <laughs> but nothing ever like it in the history of humanity. I mean, if you understand that, that's intercession. You know, he, he, he was saying, you, you think you have nuclear weapons? We have more. And he said, my battle works. <laughs> Yours does not. Well, you see, that's, it, it may sound uh, too rough, but that's, that's what negotiation is. And then have you noticed, he will come down and, and, and talk. It's an amazing sight uh, to see how, how he uh, facilitates all of this. You know, we should pray that he will succeed. But uh, the lesson there is, the appeal is universal. It's not automatic. Who are the intercessors now? Of course, Jesus is the intercessors, but who are the intercessors now? It's us. We find a person who's not saved. Well, God draws them to us. Find them where they are at, okay? And tell them what God wants so that they can have what they want. Yeah. I told you the story. My wife, we were in the airport. My wife was, uh, I forgot where we were, what? 
I need coffee, lined up in Starbucks. And there's a Hispanic woman behind her. And she strikes conversation. And she said, she's married, she's been praying for children. She said, hey, listen, God will give you children. Witness right there. Witness right there. And you say, God can give you children. He opens the wombs and this and that. And, and the, the Starbucks is open. Before they went in front, he led, she led her to the Lord. And she was so grateful. After she led her to the Lord, she was in front. The lady says, well, you, you, you witness to me, you pray for me. Uh, I got this coffee. And so I got free coffee. You see? Now she could say, no way. Uh, and it could upset her. You see, that's, that's what you call It's about time that we Christians bring this universal opportunity for people to get saved and us take our place as intercessors. That's what intercession is. It's not saying, I'm going to pray for you. Of course, prayer is involved. Uh, It's not like that. Intercessor is a mediator. You find the will of both parties, fuse them together, make them agree. That's intercession. And how do you do that? You pray. You pray to God, and you appeal to men. By the way, in the old English, they call it praying to men. I pray you, please, be merciful. They use that language uh, also in those days. So, so now, that's intercession. Because if we don't, the potential of salvation will never be realized in people's lives. You know. God has drawn people in your circle. It starts with families, it starts with friends, your co-workers, your missionaries. Introduce Jesus to them. Intercede for them. Bring them to the Lord. Then bring them to church. Let's disciple them. Amen? And let them disciple others also. Praise God. Let's all stand.